All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to this month's Tennessee Trains on Tuesday webinar. I am Brad Adams. By day, I am a business intelligence developer um, for the Diagnostic Labs at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And by night, I am the website chair for Tennessee HFMA, um, which is why I'm here with you guys today. Um, so we have got a great presentation coming up for you guys about lean process improvements. But before we get to that, um, I want to go through a couple of announcements. We have got several additional educational events coming up in the next couple of months this spring. Um, starting in just about a week from now, the Spring Payer Summits kick off, and those are going to run from March 18th through the 26th, um, and we're going to be in Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, and the Tri-Cities area. Um, so you can visit our website, tnhfma.org, um, for more information on those and to register. Um, also in Nashville on March 19th, uh, that's a Thursday. We're going to have a networking event tied into the start of the March Madness tournament. Um, that is going to be from noon until either 5 or 6, for which um, at Jonathan's in the Cool Springs area. So you can find out more information about that on the website. Um, we're also going to be putting up a link this year um, for an NCAA pool for, for all the chapter members and friends who want to participate and, and fill out a bracket. We'll be able to do that online, and that'll be up on the website and on social media uh, later today. We have also got in May our Spring Institute getting ready, um, and that is going to be May 18th through the 20th. That is going to be for the third year um, at the Embassy Suites down in Cool Springs in the Franklin area. And this year the golf tournament is going to be after the Spring Institute. It's going to be on Wednesday afternoon, May 20th. And so we are busy prepping all of those details and information um, to get out to you guys. So, so be watching your email soon because that information is going to be coming out hopefully in the next week or two. Um, the other thing to remind everybody of is if you need a continuing education certificate for this webinar, um, a couple of the requirements for our policies, you need to answer at least two of the three polling questions we'll be giving and be in attendance for at least 90% of the duration um, of the webinar. Um, so just remember those two things, and I'll remind you about the polling questions throughout. If you have questions about your CPE certificate, um, you can email cpe at tnhfma.org, and it usually takes us about two weeks um, to, to get the attendance report prepared and get those certificates emailed to you. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it'll be about two weeks or so before you can expect to get those in your email if you if you said you needed one. Um, so that takes care of all the announcements. So it is my pleasure to introduce today um, Ann Pontius. Ann is a senior medical practice consultant with State Volunteer Mutual Insurance Company. She's been there since 2008. Um, prior to that, she was a principal and the owner of a Laboratory Compliance Consultants, Inc. Um, for over 18 years. So Ann is an active member of Clinical Laboratory Management Association. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ann so we can get into learning about lean. Good morning, or good afternoon, I guess, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, thank you, Brad. I appreciate the introduction and um, the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Um, and judging from all the things you have coming up, I might have to join your association. Sounds like a lot of fun things. Um, our objectives today uh, reads a bit like a paragraph. Um, you know, it would be wonderful at the end of this session if you're able to promote a quality improvement culture by utilizing the lean process improvement techniques that enable you to discover waste and redundancy in your processes. Then you can organize or reorganize what you do according to the 5S um, program principles. And then by doing so, hopefully you'll end up with improved processes that are more efficient. Now, you know, as Brad mentioned, um, part of the continuing education process uh, requires that we do a few polling questions. So I'd like to get us started with one of those right now to gauge the diversity of quality improvement cultures in which you work. So Brad, may we have that first polling question now? Absolutely, Ann. So our first polling question asks, does your practice have a quality improvement culture? So please select one of the following answers. No. Yes. I don't know what a quality improvement culture is. 
and I am not sure. So remember, um, if you want your CPE certificate, you need to go ahead and answer the polling questions. There is no right or wrong answers on these when it comes to CPE. Um, you just need to submit an answer so that we know you are paying attention and not out at lunch. So, and I'm going to leave this up for a little bit longer to give people a chance to uh, to vote, but 88% um, of, of the folks have responded, um, and 88% of those said that, yes, they do actually have a quality improvement culture within their organization. Oh, my gosh, that is great. It, um, it's so good to hear and see that businesses are adopting quality improvement activities because as more and more companies do so, then hopefully the sys all systems will become more efficient and then um, yeah, that will then reduce the cost of healthcare overall, which will benefit everybody. Um, but if somebody did answer no or they're not sure, I hope that you feel like you've come to the right place and hopefully um, by the end of this session you'll have a better understanding of what a quality improvement culture is all about. So when we talk about culture, what are we actually talking about? Well, it's just like your family or society that has a culture. Um, your work environment does too. So culture is defined as a way of life for a group of people, and it's based on the common behaviors, beliefs, and values of that group. So these traits and characteristics, you know, they're passed on by communication and imitation, uh, not to be confused with intimidation. Uh, and I have accidentally misused those two words before. So I know that you all are mute, but I imagine that you're laughing hysterically because at some point in time you probably worked in an environment of intimidation rather than imitation. So, but let's hope that doesn't last long. So talking about the work culture, you know, what are some of the uh, drivers that create that work culture? Well, first and foremost should be your mission statement. So I wonder if you can recite your company's mission statement. I can just imagine you turn into the person next to you and saying, we have a mission statement. Um, some businesses live by their mission statement, and some don't even have one. Now, if you're in that latter group, I strongly urge you to come up with one. From a quality improvement standpoint, you know they're, they're really necessary to ensure that operations of the business are focused on achieving the mission of the practice or the business. Because without that mission statement, how do you know what your ultimate goal of success is? You know, the business mission statement drives your company's strategies. It's a beacon or a light uh, that everybody should aim for. You know, it helps keep your staff, um, the administrators, and even the owners uh, focused on a goal of meeting that mission. Now, along with the mission statement, there are core values. Um, they set the expectations um, for staff behavior. Now, if your staff doesn't exemplify those core behaviors, then, you know, they shouldn't be part of your group or, you know, another way to say it is they shouldn't be on your bus because they can steer you away from your mission and really make things difficult for you and other staff to be able to achieve your mission. Your culture, um, it's also defined by the services you provide. So, you know, you have to think about are you providing all services relevant to financial management, or maybe just a subset of those services. Now, if you don't effectively communicate your mission and your core values, you really shouldn't have the expectation that your staff will exemplify them. So it's important to have champions that continually communicate and reinforce these cultural drivers and you know, have everything to do with making sure that your culture turns out the way you want it to. Um, without that concerted effort to promote that, your mission, you know, it leaves your staff kind of choosing their own beacon, um, and that can really be destructive to the business because what happens is it becomes self-serving to the individual rather than focused on your clients. You know, and you know, so so just well, just I'm sure all of you, or at least 88% of you, have a mission statement. But for those that that don't, um, let's just look at an example here. This is a very simplified one, but again, the mission statement. You know, it states the purpose of your organization, its reason for existing. And so here we're talking about um, to provide a high quality service to both patient, to our patients, both clinically and administratively. And then in order to achieve that, they've set up core values. And these are those principles that guide the organization's internal conduct 
but it also sets the relationship with their external world as well. And examples of core values include integrity, responsibility, being accountable, working together as a team, effectiveness, efficiency, having the motto that patients come first, uh, respect for one another, compassion. These are all core values, and I'm sure your company has a list of additional ones that um, they expect of you. And we, you know, you can see how, um, you know, this is how the staff is expected to behave in order to meet that mission statement. And, um, you know, often we'll look at a mission statement and we see that the word quality is in there. So how do we go about defining what quality is? Well, it is a degree or grade of excellence. And we commonly say that it might be low, mediocre, high. Um, so a while ago, just to give you an example of how we grade these things, you know, a while ago I was at a McDonald's drive-thru and all I wanted to do was get a soda and get through the line. I was on my way to a meeting. But the car in front of me ordered five burgers and I swear to you there was something different on every burger. Now ketchup on one, extra onions on another. And I knew all this because I had my window down. Well, um, when I finally got my drink, it was 10 minutes later, I decided that I, for me, I had a low quality experience because it did not meet my expectation. Meanwhile, the guy who ordered all the burgers was probably thrilled with his quality experience and he would rate that McDonald's probably high quality because he got just what he wanted on all of his burgers. So you can see how quality can be defined but it can be measured too. You know, quality is in the eye of the stakeholder um, and it's, it's measured usually against expectations. You know, you partially set those expectations with that mission statement of yours and also those core values. You know, your physicians, they have their expectations, as well as your staff and your patients. They have their own way of grading your quality uh, because they have their own expectations. And then we have, we get into the, the government and commercial payers, and it, it's, they're telling us what quality is. So we don't really have a choice here. You know, they're giving us things that we're being graded against. So you have to pay attention to those so that you make sure to try to achieve that high quality um, standard. You know, for instance, um, meaningful use criteria. You know, if you don't meet those, then the government is saying, well, you're not providing as high quality service as somebody else who is meeting those quality indicators. You know, so, you know, quality improvement activities as a whole, uh, I hope you don't ever think they're a one and done, because that's not the way it's meant to be. It's really meant to be continuous. You know, so with that in mind, sort of one of my mantras is always, the best can always get better. Um, and, you know, you, just what areas, you know, when you're thinking about what you do, you know, take a look at all the different areas in which you have that opportunity to improve your services. So this is a, a diagram to show most of the facets involved in the revenue cycle. You know, so it's evident there are lots of processes associated with financial management. And we mainly, um, in our company at State Volunteer, we mainly use this slide to educate physicians. Um, so many, you know, there's so many areas that can go wrong um, that can influence the ability for the business to become profitable. And our physicians, we find often, are thinking simply that I give you a code, you bill it, we get paid. And it's like, well, you know, don't we wish it was that easy? You know, knowing you have all these areas that influence the revenue cycle, you know, you know, there are reasons why you might want to change what you're currently doing. And so I'd ask that question, you know, um, you know, what are you doing, how are you doing it, and is there a possibility that you can do it better? So for each of these processes, there are drivers that can push you to want to make improvements. So just going over a few of those, you know, um, when I'm talking to, to staff, I like to generally, I try not to use the word change because uh, it, it tends to just evoke this uh, bad kind of feeling that, you know, everybody's comfortable in their own zone, they know what they're doing, and you say change, and then the hair goes up on the back of their neck and they get uncomfortable. But instead, I, I like to use the word improvement. It, it tends to get better buy-in from everybody. And, you know, you know, we're as 
nobody wants to change, they might be willing to improve something because when you're improving something, you get the feeling that it's actually making your life a little better. So there are several improvement drivers, you know, such as you know, looking at your poor collection ratios. It's something that you can measure, which is very important. Um, measuring something, uh, you, know, you really can't you know, say you're successful or you're not successful unless you can measure it. So you always want to look at your processes that you have the capability of measuring. Um, not meeting quotas for timely filing, you know, denial management, you know, is it being worked appropriately, how is it working out for you, you know, efficient um, payment postings, you know, how is that working, um, have, you know, having to meet compliance strategies, you know, are you set up with an, um, are you doing the formal OIG program for compliance, have you got internal audits, are you looking at correct coding, you know, are your physicians providing that? You know, are your coders doing that? You know, how efficient is it for your coders to get information back from physicians when they question them? How about setting up processes to avoid um, embezzlement issues? You know, we always think that nobody in our business would ever try to embezzle, but we see and hear about it more and more and from some of the most unlikely people in the whole world, like the 70-year-old mother of a physician who is helping out at the practice. But it's crazy things we hear out there. Or another driver could be, you know, having to implement a new procedure. So uh, you've probably been helping your businesses meet uh, meaningful use if you're working directly with a physician. Um, you know, you've got the implementation of ICD-10 coming up. So you know, how, how are you going to manage that? So looking at your processes and being able to weave the new information in and training into those processes is going to be very important and it'll, it will certainly help with the success of that if you do it in, uh, with a methodology. Another driver for changing is physicians aren't responding to your requests in a timely fashion. You don't want to hold on to coach. You need to get those bills out the door. You've got to meet timely filing requirements. You know, your staff aren't working together as a team. Do you ever feel like you're drowning and the person next to you is, it looks to me like they're doing nothing. Well, why aren't they over here helping you uh, each and out your workload? And we all know that in healthcare, the expenses are rising and revenues are decreasing. And so those are certainly drivers to make us want to become more efficient so we're getting the best bang for the buck that we can um, imagine. And another driver that um, sometimes gets lost in all the messages is the mission and the core values. Are you using that mission as a beacon to head for that light? Um, you know, do people understand the core values? And if not, that's a reason to make some changes or improvements in your um, in your processes. So I'm sure that you know you all can look back at that list and think of many of your own circumstances. You know, um, sometimes it motivates you to implement an improvement. You know, your your staff is going to look for you to do this in some kind of a consistent methodology. Um, you know, something that doesn't threaten them. So this means you need some kind of method that is consistent and successful, and it's it has to be understandable by your staff so that they'll participate in that. So let's let's look at at some of the going into some of the methodology part of this. So you know. What I like, I, I love thinking about total quality management, and it's just something that you embed in everything that you do. It's in all of your day-to-day -day operations, and so the definition is that it's a management strategy aimed at embedding awareness of quality in all your organizational processes, and it, it really does need to have champions that walk the talk. It's not something that, all right, we're going to train everybody on lean processes today and then in a year we'll come back and we'll train them again. That's not how this is going to work for you. In order for it to work, it has to be something that is continually looked at and approved upon. So if we're talking about processes, what are they? Well, they're a collection of related structured activities or tasks that produce a specific service. And generally, you visualize this um, by a flow chart or some type of written steps. And then the way you go about improving that process, which is making it better, 
um, is to get everybody together and collaborate. Um, you know, get all the people who are um, have any kind of are, are touched by this process or involved in this process. Get them together and map that out. Map, map that process out so that you can look at it and determine where is the waste and redundancy, and then add value to that process. And by doing so, you will, in fact. Uh, enhance the efficiency at all of that. And you can, you know, if it all it looks good on paper, but you need to really um, bring it up and put it where everybody can see it, so everybody can then have an input into that. So years ago, I used to work at Duke University, and they had uh, they created a culture for continuous quality improvement, and to help everybody get on board, they used to, they created this acronym called FOCUS, and I've always enjoyed using this, and FOCUS stood for finding a process that you were going to improve, and that meant we had to be able to benchmark that process, and we also be, needed to be able to make goals for that, and then we had to organize a team that clarify the knowledge, uh, understand the causes of variation, and select the improvement, but what FOCUS didn't really do for me was explain how are we going to go about clarifying the knowledge and understanding the causes of variation. And that's where our lean methodology comes in. So you can see by my arrows here that we come across from clarifying knowledge over to our lean method. And our lean method includes doing our process mapping, and I'm going to show you an example of that. Once we have that mapped out, we can then look for the different areas of waste, and we'll talk about those in a second. Then we can organize everything back based on our five principles, and that all helps us understand our causes of variation and also helps us select an improvement that makes sense for what we're trying to achieve with our goals. And I've always liked the Nike saying, just do it. And because I am one of the world's best procrastinators, on my computer I keep something that says, the only way to get ahead is to get started. And that has helped me sometimes. So the lean processing, um, the lean tool and doing the process map, it really doesn't have to be a big dramatic opportunity. It is something that can be done easy. And that's what I love about it. All you need is um, a wide rolling paper, sticky notes, markers, um, tape, and tacks. And what you'll end up doing is putting a big piece paper on the wall and then everybody putting the steps up, um, they take individual notepads and so you have one sticky note per process step and you have to have a well-defined starting point, a well-defined end point and then you ask the people who are involved in that process to put up the steps in between the starting point and the end point and then you move those sticky notes around until you get a clear understanding of all the steps that are involved in that process. And you want to include what are called sub-processes and variations. So your sub-processes would be, if um, we look back at that revenue cycle um, diagram, then everything under the headers could be considered sub-processes. And it's real important to identify those because you don't want to make a change to one process that could influence a sub-process or maybe cut out a sub-process because they're important and you need to recognize that they're there. Also, you can include forms on this um, on your process map and that helps you identify what work is included in the process itself. So here I'm just showing you an example of a process map that was done and this happened to be for uh, a new patient to their first visit. It was three different sites and they were trying to standardize their work and right in this very beginning uh, we saw a huge variation in the way they did their processes. Now we're talking about doing the same process but doing it differently. So the very first thing we asked these people is how do you get your referral? And one group said, well, uh, when a phone call comes in, we get out a piece of paper and we document the information. We pull the computer up, uh, we make a schedule an appointment for the patient, and then we um, type everything into the computer that we had written down on paper. The second person says, well, we don't accept any calls. 
they have to fax in all the information on a referral form. So they can call and ask us for the referral form or fax it to them, and then they need to fax that back. And then the third one says they call in, we bring up our computer screen, we type in the information directly into it, we schedule the patient, and we're done. So same process, but three very different ways to do it right from the beginning. And you can see on here, these are sub-processes across the top and variations, and these are the forms, and they're put on the, pro the process map about where they occurred in the process. And just to let you know, that process did have an end to it. Um, it didn't go on into infinity. And I bring this up because one of the goals of this particular meeting was that this, um, these, this um, organization wanted to go for meaning, uh, meaningful use criteria. So over here we have the meaningful use criteria, and what we were looking for is where then could we put these into this process where it made sense in the flow and that we knew we were capturing everything that we needed to capture in order to qualify for the meaningful use dollars. So that's one way that you can see how this process map is being used. Now another tool that is used um, to help understand what all is involved in the process is called the, the um, spaghetti diagram. And, it, and it's, it's a tool and, you know, I'll go into practices and, uh, you know, I'll be asked to observe to help folks um, figure out how to become more efficient. And I do this um, in my head by taking floor plans and then uh, I do an imaginary string, say I'm looking at a receptionist and how they're doing their job. And so I'll start the string with them sitting at their um, desk and then for every time they make a movement on the floor plan, I follow that along and tack it down wherever they stop and then I start my string again as they move. And so they end up you know, showing a diagram of how their movement has been through the practice during this time period. It is truly just a snapshot in time. But you can use it not only to capture the staff flow, but you can use it for paper flowing through the practice. You can look at you know, how information flows electronically through the practice as well, and you can also follow the money. You know, everybody wants to know where's money, but that's important for you all to know that. Um, and I find the easiest way to do it is just to document it right on a set of floor plans. So you end up with something that looks similar to this, you know, a spaghetti map. And this is showing the movement of different things throughout uh, this particular business. Um, now, your practice may look like this, or your business may look like this. I'm just seeing you all laughing hysterically now, but uh, maybe not, hopefully not. Uh, but I have been in some practices where I think it looks like that. So once you have mapped out your process, then you want to start to think about it in terms of adding value. So what do you have to know to add value to that process or make that process more efficient? So you need to identify what is considered value added. That means it's an essential step to that process. You could not get an end result unless that step was included in the process. And what you're trying to eliminate or minimize are those non-value added steps which are considered waste. So waste definition is that it's the expenditure of resources for any goal other than the creation of value to that process or procedure. And once you have your process map laid out, it becomes very clear and visible to your staff that here we have redundancy or here we have somebody doing all these extra steps that really aren't necessary to the process. And thereby you can start to change the way you do that process to make it more efficient. Now these are just um, different types of waste that are considered to be part of the process. So transportation, unnecessary transportation, just realize if you're inventorying a lot of things, and I put inventory and unnecessary transportation a lot of times I put them together because I see places that will have a huge room dedicated to inventory and staff spends a lot of time going down to the inventory storage room to get something and bring it back. And 
when that happens, you stand the risk of losing something or delaying something or breaking something, whereas if it was just inventory directly onto the staff's, say, desk, um, then it becomes a lot more efficient and you eliminate some of that waste. Uh, motion, uh, the more you open, close, or um, use something, the more likely you are to wear it out. Waiting is considered uh, waste as well, so if you have like bills that are waiting to be sent to the payer, you know, that's wasteful time. The more you can, quicker you can get them out, the quicker you can get paid. I think it's interesting that they say in traditional processes, a large part of an individual product's life is spent waiting to be worked on. Do you ever feel that way? I know sometimes when I go do things, I feel that way. Overproduction, um, we see this in healthcare more than we'd like. Uh, redundancy, like with patient services. Um, for instance, a child goes to the hospital and they get an x-ray and then they have to go to the, the doctor's office the next day and the doctor says in, instead of using the x-ray that was done at the hospital, they say we're going to do an x-ray here in my office. And that's redundant and it's wasteful to the system. Overprocessing, an area of overprocessing could involve um, ordering an MRI where really an x-ray was only necessary. And defects are definitely waste in a process. When you have something that is defective, that means that you're not able to use it. And so now you have to spend time to go back to redo whatever it is to get something that is actually usable in the um, end result. So we want to try to eliminate defects as much as possible. Another area identified as waste is people potential. And this is unused creativity and underutilized human capital. And we see this a lot in businesses. Nobody knows your processes better than you do. And asking the people who are involved in those processes to think about how they can be, make them more effective and more efficient is probably your most cost-effective way of improving those types of services that you are um, providing. So once you have that process map laid out and you've identified where the waste is in that system, there are also other things that you can do with that process map that can become very beneficial. So some of the metrics associated with process mapping is like lead time. And this is the total time, the elapsed time from the first step to the last step of the uh, process, also known as turnaround time or throughput time. Um, and it's an, you can measure how long does it take to get that bill through our system. You know, and the process time is the time it takes to actually perform the work. So that's how much are you touching that information or how much are you talking about the information. You, know, you actually are working on that particular item or service. And what you're trying to do is get um, as much of your process time to equal your lead time. Because if you have 100% of your process time is your lead time, then you're going to have a totally efficient process with no waste in it. Now, we know that it's very difficult to get to that point, but that's what you want to strive for. And when you do that, another thing that you want to measure is your percent complete and accurate. So how often did it result in work that is usable? How often is it done right? And when you, can, when you get to that point, then you're able to look at, when you get to 100% complete and accurate, then you're able to avoid the most common areas of rework, and those three being correcting information that should have been correct when you originally got it, adding missing information that should have been supplied to you originally, or clarifying information that should have been clear right from the get-go. And I know in the work that you do, you do spend a lot of time having to do all three of these. And the more time you spend doing that, the less time you're able to get something done that should have been done correctly uh, the first time around. So there are other things that you can measure with this process map. For instance, how many people are involved in this process? We know that the more people you have in a process, the less efficient it is. Um, and the reason being 
it's just think of it like the old secret game. When you start a secret and you pass it around the room, by the time it's whispered back in your ear, it's nothing like it originally started. So if you can keep one person focused on as many steps as possible through a process, then you have a better chance of it being more efficient. You're not doing the handoffs. Every time you hand off a process, the person who is handing it off has to back up a few steps to tell the person who is accepting the process where they need to start. The backing up for the person who is handing it off is redundancy for them. So the less time you have people handing off things, the more streamlined that process can be. Now, there are certain times when you absolutely should hand off processes. And that's when you get to somebody at the top of somebody's scope of practice or at the top of their licensure, wherever they are no longer allowed to provide a service. So certainly handing off work from somebody who is on the job trained to a professional coder or in, a, um, in the clinical area handing off work from a um, MA to a nurse and from a nurse to a physician, those are all areas where you'd absolutely have to hand off and they're essential. But if you're doing work from uh, one coder to the next coder and they are equally qualified, why we, we would ask the question, why does it have to be handed off? Also measuring the number of steps. Again, the more steps you have in the process, the more opportunities you have for error. So being able to cut out some steps may make it more efficient. We can also measure the amount of money that's spent on that process. You can certainly put a dollar sign to it um, as it is, and then you can make your improvement and then look at how much money you've saved by making those improvements. And you can also uh, measure that, that um, efficiency, the percent of how many times it's complete and accurate before you do your improvements and then after you do those improvements. So now that you've kind of looked at your map, you want to think about how do we get things put back and back together. So let's take a look at your workspace. You know, how functional is it? Um, do you have everything you need within your reach? You know, say you have a task that requires you to staple two pieces of paper together, and you do this like 90% of your work time. If you store your stapler, say, up in a cabinet, uh, then every time you need it, you have to open the door to the cabinet, bring down the stapler, staple your papers together, then put the stapler back up in the cabinet and close the cabinet door. Now think about how much more efficient that process could be if you were to have that stapler sitting right in front of you on your desk. Now you, all you have to simply do is take your two pieces of paper together and staple them. So you've eliminated all of the non-essential steps and you've maintained um, the value added step that is required to get the product, uh, the finished product that's usable. You know, this is just an example of how you can put things in order. You know, once you, you sort what you need, you know, eliminate, you know, and hide what you don't need. Um, because when you have things all over the place that you aren't really using, they become distractors. And so you, you want to, you know, eliminate those as much as possible. So then you set them in order and you standardize them, you shine and sweep them to keep them clean and usable, and then periodically review the situation to ensure that it stays set in order. You know, and as for standardization, it's been proven that it brings efficiency to your processes. You know, so from your office procedures, if everybody is doing the same process the same way, then it's going to um, give you something that's going to be very easy to benchmark and it's going to make it easy for your staff to go from uh, to helping out each other to have that teamwork really put into place. And then also think about your workstations, you know, uh, by having them standardized so that they are all set up sort of in the same fashion. Of course, we've got left-handers and right-handers and you have to make accommodations for them. But basically the station's being set up the same. Then if you have to have somebody sit in for somebody else, they're not wasting time looking for items and they're able to quickly move into the uh, of being uh, producing whatever it is that you're trying to produce. Another area that we see a lot of issues in, there, 
where they can become inefficient is forms. Uh, for some reason, even though we, we're moving into an electronic age, we seem to still have tons of paper forms out there. And of course, you need to have some mechanism in order to get information, information from the patients, information from the doctors, information from nurses. Uh, and so when you think about your forms, there is there are tools to manage those forms. And all I've done here is just to give you an example of a way that you can set your forms up so hopefully that you can um, make them as efficient as possible and reduce the redundancy as much as possible. And what we're talking about here is if you think back to the process map I showed you down at the bottom, you saw where we had all those forms. So we can take a, another sheet of big paper, pull those forms up, put those um, forms on that sheet of paper in the order in which they occur and look at the information, look for areas of redundancy and then create new forms based on consolidating those old ones and making sure though that we do capture all the information that everybody needs because it could be one form is serving the front office people, the insurance people, the clinical people and the billing people. So you have to make sure everything is captured on them. And so you take your new form and put it up on top of uh, your older forms, not directly on top, but above them on your big piece of paper. And then you can draw lines to connect where you went from the old information to the consolidated new information on the new form. And then leave it up there so that everybody gets to come through and nobody can say, well, I don't have my information anymore because you've shown them where on the new form their information exists, but you're making it easier with less paper shuffled throughout the entire practice. So, you know, it's real important though that everybody is involved in that process. So then once you get to the point of, um, you know, taking these tools and looking at your process, that's when you want to think about this is where we need to really lean this process. So how are we going to add to it, delete to it, or rearrange these steps to make it more efficient? Think about those added value steps and the non-added value steps and work with those. And consider the consequences to others. So make sure you look at the sub-processes that you've identified. Uh, don't cut out a step that all of a sudden you find the sub-process has been eliminated as well. From a people standpoint, staff standpoint, delegate tasks or steps to the appropriate credentialed and licensed individuals. So I ask the question, you know, are your certified coders tasked just the same as your on-the-job trained personnel? You know, are you paying your coders the same as your on-the-job trained personnel? Probably not. So, you know, there's an article that MGMA did, uh, and there's probably one by the Financial Management Association too that um, talks about utilizing staff in a very lean methodology. Uh, but if you don't have one, you can go to this MGMA one and Google it. And it's a very short article, but it re really hones in on being able to task staff appropriately based on their abilities um, and getting the best bang for your buck with your uh, personnel costs. Once you have leaned this process, you want your staff to look at it, to accept it, and then you want to train everybody on it. Then uh, measure the benchmarks, see if you are improving, monitor it, and you know what? Maybe it looked good on paper, but it really didn't help in the long run. You weren't able to process more claims. You weren't able to um, shorten your AR. You know, so you know this is where. Yeah, if there is a failure, identify that. Figure out what needs to be tweaked. Why didn't it work? And then use that as a learning experience to move on. So I'm thinking, Brad, at this point, this might be a good time to um, bring up our next uh, two, well, actually our final two polling questions. Uh, is that possible? Absolutely. So our next polling question do you think the lean quality improvement methods can work in your facility? Your options are no, yes, maybe, or this doesn't really apply to me. So remember, if you want to get your CPE certificate, you need to respond to at least two of the three polling questions. 
Um, and I forgot to mention this earlier, but if you do have questions for Anne, there is a questions box there in your GoToWebinar controls. Um, and you can go ahead and submit those questions um, directly through that box, and then we will get to those at the end of the presentation today. So Anne, I'm going to leave this open for about 20 more seconds, but 90% of our attendees have responded. Um, <clears throat> and of those 75%, now 76% have responded yes, with 16 responding maybe, and the other nine, this doesn't really apply to them. So might be folks who are sole practitioners and that type of thing. Okay. Well, well, that that's great. At least we didn't get anybody that said absolutely no. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think it's great that a uh, large percentage of you think that this can apply, and so many of you said that you already have a quality improvement uh, program in place that I imagine you're doing, if you're not doing this exactly as I've described it, you're probably doing some variation of it. Um, so I, I think that's that's wonderful. And if you answered no, you know, I encourage you to give it a try um, and see if it works. And also I encourage you, if you answer no, that um, it wouldn't work, or no, you didn't say no, you said maybe, you know, um, tell us what it is that maybe it is that you're going to be able to do. So um, in our question box, you could just, you know, give us the reason why you're saying, saying maybe or maybe, maybe not. Um, all right, do you want to give us our last polling question? Absolutely. So what would be your first step to implement changes in your current processes? So your options are find a process that needs improving, find a physician that will be a change champion, sneak in the change without telling the staff, educate staff on lean principles, or document the steps of the process. So once again, we'll leave that open for, for a couple of seconds. And just a reminder, if you've got questions um, for Anne or comments, uh, please go ahead and put those in the questions box. So, and we've got about 80% of, a uh, little over 80% of the people who have voted. We're going to leave this open for a couple seconds more, but it is a dead heat uh, with 38% of the folks answering um, A, find a process that needs improving, and 38% of the, the folks answering uh, D, educate the staff on lean principles, and 19% saying document the steps. Okay. All right. Well, I think that I think that's absolutely great. Um, actually, your uh, first the find a process that needs improving and educating the lean principles. And actually, it we I had said find a physician that will change be a change champion. But finding anybody that will be a change champion, any of those three could, could absolutely come first. You have to know your environment and what works in your environment. And sometimes it takes finding a process that needs improving to, in order to know who the champion is going to be. Um, and you do that before educating folks on me. But in a lot of circumstances, you know, go right for educating the staff on lean principles first. And then that way your staff can come to you and say, this is a process that I think needs to improve. Be improved, but I think you do before you document your steps. You do need to educate your staff on the lean principles, and you need to find that process for improving. So that's great. We've gotten some really good insight there um, from these polling questions, and I appreciate everybody participating on those as well. Um, so I just want to share with you some of the issues that in. in um, you know, in my experience from being in lots of different types of facilities, uh, some of the areas that have been a little problematic. So one of them just has to do with the facility structure itself. You know, I'm always hoping for situations that provide visibility for staff so that it makes it very easy for somebody to know if someone else is just overwhelmed with work that then they can go and help them just by visibly seeing them. But with everybody in their cubes or either in their offices, it's very hard to know who's overwhelmed and who is not overwhelmed, unless you have some kind of good communication structure through 
your electronic methods, you know, whether it's your practice management system or your electronic health record, that you can kind of signal somebody that, you know, I'm drowning over here, come over and help me. But we often see a lot of walls that create barriers to helping you be efficient. We also don't see that standardization is in place. And so without the standardization, people don't feel comfortable going and working in somebody else's workspace. Um, because they, they know it's not there. So when you go and you know, say so I go into um, you know offices, business offices, and I see that you know folks have customized that office to be their shrine, and they have all their pictures of all their children up. They have all the knickknacks that they've gathered from every trip they've ever taken, and sometimes if somebody needs to sit in that spot because that person is off for a day, but the work still needs to get done, then all of these things are distractors, and, and it causes them to be less efficient than if they walked into a very professional standardized spot that was very similar to their own, then they could just pick up the pace and keep right on working. So standardization uh, is also something that causes folks not to be uh, efficient. We're also seeing where the OIG compliance recommendations are not being performed in just day-to-day -day operations. You know, right now, um, it's not a requirement. It's still voluntary to do um, the OIG's uh, compliance program. So if you aren't familiar with what I'm talking about, I encourage you to Google the OIG compliance and look at third-party billing program they have, because those are some of the things you should be doing in your day-to-day -day operations, um, such as as audits and other things, and um, you don't want to let that go by. So I know people are probably saying, you know, I've implemented the OIG compliance recommendations, and now I'm inefficient because I'm having to spend time doing all these things. The reality is if it becomes uh, a requirement, you're going to have to do them, so you're going to have to figure out how to place them into your routine operations in an efficient way. We also see redundant documentation systems. So we have, and, and you know, some of these are good, some of these are bad. You, know, you have EHR systems, but the EHR system, say, doesn't talk to your practice management system. So you create a paper so that you can capture the codes that need to be built. Um, but then you have to go back into the EHR to try to figure out if they provided you the right paper information. And so you know, even though up here I have written EHR and paper for redundancy, we have EHR and practice management systems, and I ask, you know, how well do they talk to each other? Um, you know, are you having to spend a lot of time going to interrupt a physician to ask them for, you know, what did you mean by this documentation, or I need additional documentation in order to code this certain way? So looking at those systems uh, can also help you become more efficient. You know, phone calls, uh, the management of phone calls, there is a science to doing that, you know. Who mans the phone? You know, are your staff being interrupted with messages all day? Whereas if your staff directly answered a phone, could they have taken care of the situation without being interrupted? On the other hand, are your staff answering the phone and therefore they can't get any of their work done? Whereas if you had an outsider answering the phone and then they could at one time during the day call, make callbacks and do whatever, that might be a better management system. But we certainly do see inefficiency when it comes to handling phone calls. Um, also, I want to point out that um, you know, if, if you're working in a facility where your physicians are the ones that are generating the revenue, then you want to keep the physicians performing, uh, keep them from <laughs> physicians performing non-revenue tasks. If you have that going on, then you've got a problem because you want physicians to perform revenue tasks. Um, so you know, that's why we are called support staff because we are supporting them in what they're doing so they can generate revenue. So you want to proactively do that, and that's something you can look at in your processes. You know, staff placement as well as equipment placement, uh, you know, you want your staff to be in a good location. A lot of times, uh, you know, we'll have financial management people that um, they're in the business office, but they have to talk to patients and work directly with patients. And meanwhile, the patient has to walk all around the hospital or around the health system in order to get to the financial people. You know, why can't we put them near the lobby or near the, the 
um, entrance where they're having to come in and sign in for their services. Uh, equipment placement, I constantly see, I call it the whack-a-mole situation, where we have staff that are constantly popping up and down out of their seat to go make a copy because the, the, the copier is not near them, or they're having to get faxes and the fax machine is nowhere near them, or they're having to scan information and they don't have a scanner next to them. So all of those can be, equipment can be placed in situations to make them more efficient. And then staff education not being performed. Um, you know, the more you educate your staff, the more they can help you identify those areas that are not efficient within your systems. So to kind of tie this all together, I found this little um, diagram that I thought was pretty neat. Um, so it's talking about here that you have a mission statement that defines the work processes you do and you execute those and that helps you make decisions about considering information that might employ technology to help with your process so you better gather that information that supports your decisions, that guide your work processes so you can accomplish that mission. And I thought that was really good. And then I looked and realized it came from our government. If only they, too, would see this and use that, right? Again, you are laughing hysterically, about to fall out of your chair. But in summary, you know, I ask that you maybe think about, you know, do you have the right culture? And that's where we started this program, and that's where I think you need to start as well. You know, and where is there a problem? Go back and look at that revenue cycle um, diagram. You know, you've got a lot of places where there could be a problem. So that's a good place to start. Can you benchmark it? You know, can you identify what would be considered an appropriate success goal? And then start that mapping. Do your maps and then look for those areas where you um, have uh, non-value added, where there's waste in there, um, and then redefine that process. Uh, implement it. You don't need to roll it out over the entire business office. You can just do a test, you know, just do a few bills or do a few claims um, and see how it works. Get the buy-in, tweak it, and then monitor and measure it. And then communicate. Communication is essential to efficiency. And just say thank you to these folks. But sometimes if you have, if you take a process and you rework it and you've had a lot of people involved in it, celebrate. Have a pizza party. Give them $5 gas cards or something. But communicate, communicate, communicate. I think that is truly the essential part of having an efficient program and processes. So with that, um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all. I really appreciated it. And if we have any questions, Brad, I'm happy to um, Try to answer Thank you, and yeah, we do have um, one question from Daniel, and he asks, do you find that lean becomes part of the culture and occurs without needing to bring the entire team together to map a process? Yeah, um, a great question. I appreciate that. Um, actually, once I find that, um, that it's people do it, that people start to lean whatever process they're involved in. And it not only becomes something that they lean from a professional standpoint in their business, they start to do it in their life too. They start to realize that they're running up and down the stairs five times a day, whereas if they just carried everything up in their arms one time, they wouldn't do that. So it can get a little crazy and a little overboard, but definitely I find that once you educate everybody and you give them the tools they need to understand how to map out what they're doing, how to look for redundancy and waste within their own systems, they do it themselves. And you don't have to bring together a big committee. I'm a, you know, I've done Six Sigma training and I lived in that world where we had to use it at Duke and other places. And that all involves bringing together big committees, doing a lot of uh, data gathering, whereas lean, I really like lean because you don't need to do all that. You can really, you can sit down at your desk and just draw out the 10 steps involved in your process and figure out, you know, can I do all 10 of these? Do I have to have three people involved in this, you know, and lean that yourself. So thank you. Well, that was our, our, our last question, and so thank you again. This has been a wonderful um, presentation with lots of value, I think, for, for the attendees and our, our members. Um, and so with that, with no other questions, we're going to go ahead and close out for the day. 
All right, thank you.